Hey, I'm Paul Jaffe here at the Naval Research Laboratory. I'm glad you're here. Come on in. I'm Paul Jaffe. I am an electronics engineer here at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. So what is power beaming? Power beaming is moving energy without moving mass. A lot of times we have a place where it's easier to get energy and a place where it's harder to get energy and it's difficult to connect those with wires. In such situations, it is worth looking at power beaming to see if that might solve the problem or address the challenge. So power beaming is moving energy without having to move mass. Space solar, also called solar power satellites, is where we capture the abundant sunlight that exists in space and send it to wherever it's needed on the Earth. This has the advantage of being clean, like solar on the ground, constant, not like solar on the ground, and globally distributable, which is something that we associate with satellites, but not usually with energy. And the nice thing about using the sun it is the closest thing we have in our solar system to a source of energy that is effectively unlimited. Even the oil, coal, and gas that we use today is really just stored ancient sunlight from when that sunlight came through space and helped the plants grow that then were stored for millions of years in the Earth's crust as they became these fossil fuels that we use with great abundance today. So here at the Naval Research Laboratory, we've been looking at different ways not only to get energy, but also to move energy around. One concept that we've been looking at is called space solar or solar power satellites. This is where we would tap into really the closest thing we have in the solar system to an unlimited source of energy, which is the sun. And the sun, of course, has the benefit of being able to last for billions of years. It's clean. In space, it's actually constant. There's no nighttime in space, depending on what orbit you're in. And if we collect it with a satellite, we can also distribute it kind of wherever it's needed. So it has this great quality of being globally distributable. So to help you visualize this a little bit, I have a model here that was actually built by students with commonly available parts. Here we have the sun, a simulated satellite with a solar panel on it, and a wireless power transmitter, an antenna, and then you're gonna see on the ground here we have the receiver for the energy that comes from the sun through the satellite to the Earth. So I'll turn on the sun here, and you can see the energy is received down on the Earth. Now, this is using a technology called power beaming, and you can see kind of where the power is as I move this element around. Now, we've done some demonstrations to help figure out the feasibility of this concept. One of them is called Lectena. Earlier this year, we were fortunate to have astronaut Jessica Meir on the International Space Station perform a science, technology, engineering, and math STEM demonstration involving exactly an element like this. This is just a light emitting diode, an LED, and another special kind of diode called a Schottky diode that rectifies the electromagnetic wave energy back into direct current, which is what lights up this LED. And if you look on NRL's YouTube channel, you'll see astronaut Jessica Meir on the space station lighting up one of these using just the Wi-Fi energy from the space station. And you can make it yourself at home. The components are inexpensive and relatively easy to get. It takes just a few minutes. You don't even need to solder it. You can just kind of twist them together. So that helps demonstrate how wireless power and power beaming are possible and even relatively easy to achieve on the small scale. Another thing we did this year to help investigate the feasibility of space solar is called PRAM, the Photovoltaic RF Antenna Module. And what we did is we basically took this part of this demo, the solar panel, the electronics, and the antenna, and we kept them together in this sandwich configuration, and we made a special test prototype to operate in orbit to answer some important questions about its efficiency, about how well it could get rid of waste heat, its thermal performance, and also look at other aspects that would be important if we were to make a large solar power satellite space solar system to get energy to the Earth. And to help you think a little bit about what space solar could be or might look like, we can compare it to something like the Global Positioning System, GPS, 
It was important to figure out how to do precise timekeeping in space, and this required actually putting an atomic clock on a satellite, which, when GPS was being developed, had not been done yet. So NRL figured out how to miniaturize the components of an, electronic, of an atomic clock and to fit those into a satellite and make sure that it could operate in space. Similarly, with PRAM, we're taking a small part of the system and figuring out what the challenges are, how we can make it work better, how it will be scaled up in order to make the system. NRL actually launched the first GPS satellite, and now there are dozens of GPS satellites that orbit our planet every day and give us that navigation information. So space solar might be able to do for energy what GPS has done for navigation. And for space solar, there's still a lot of work to be done. So what we did with PRAM is we made this prototype, we launched it into space on the Air Force's X-37B space plane, orbital test vehicle, and it is up there now collecting data. We get data periodically and we have a chance to look at it and we can see how efficient it was at converting the sunlight into the energy to be sent back to Earth. It doesn't actually transmit from the X-37B, but it gives us the information we need to design the next revision of the converters that will convert sunlight into electromagnetic magnetic wave energy. For power beaming, we're looking not just at using the microwave spectrum, which is the same thing you're gonna recognize from your Wi-Fi and your Bluetooth or the microwave oven in your kitchen, but also at wavelengths that are a little bit shorter, maybe into the millimeter wave or even optical light frequencies. So these are all part of the continuous electromagnetic wave spectrum. So we've looked also at doing power beaming with lasers and with different techniques to see which parts of the spectrum might make the most sense. It's clear that for space solar, you're gonna to have to have some kind of power beaming, whether it is radio waves or light or something else, because you need to get that energy you've collected down to the earth wherever it's needed, whether it's nighttime or something else. It is important, I think, to recognize how much more sunlight there is available in space than not on the earth. The best place to collect sunlight on the earth might be in a desert at the equator at noon where you might get about a thousand watts per square meter. All the time in space, 24 seven, is about 40% more than that, about 1400 watts per square meter. And that's one of the reasons that space solar has drawn attention for so long is this idea that there's this continuous source of energy sitting in space, just waiting for us to take advantage of it and send it to the earth. You don't have clouds in space, you don't have rain in space, and it is 24 seven, so you could really send it to wherever it's needed, even if you have an instance where a storm or natural disaster destroys all of the power infrastructure in a given area, you now have a way where you could supply energy to that in the absence of power plants or power lines. You just need to set up a receiver to get the energy. There's other instances where power beaming is gonna have a lot of usefulness. You can think about the drones that we use today. Many of you may have flown a hobby drone and you know that you can fly it maybe for, if you're lucky, 10, 20 minutes or so, and then you gotta recharge the battery. But imagine if instead you could just beam the energy to it continuously and it could stay flying for as long as you want it or at least until it wears out. This is another possibility that we're investigating. And there's a lot of instances where the ability to move energy without having to move mass, whether it's in the form of fuel or batteries or something else, could have a lot of value. So even if we determine that space solar is gonna to be too expensive or can't work for some other reason, the investments we're making in power beaming technology could have far reaching implications. Another place where we might see power beaming used is actually on the moon. So I mentioned that there's a lot of solar energy in space, but at the bottom of a crater that's on the pole of the moon, none of that sunlight can go because it is in a permanent shadow. The sun is always, always blocked for there. And the moon also has a two week long lunar night. So that's a really long time to be without light or heat. Now, I don't know if we really would wanna put up a lot of high voltage power lines on the moon. Maybe it would make more sense instead to set up power beaming links that we could move and change as needed depending on where power was needed. 
You could imagine if we're trying to get some of that ice that we know because of NRL's Clementine mission exists in the base of some of these permanently shadowed craters, we might send a rover down there and we might power it with a power beam so that as it moves around, it can stay powered, it can stay warm, and it can look for water and other things, other materials of interest on the moon. So there's a big opportunity for power beaming in space applications. As we move into space, just like on Earth, we're still gonna need energy and it's gonna be important not only to have sources for that, but also to be able to deliver it effectively to where it is needed, when it is needed. Testing this year in space has had a lot of history behind it, a lot of predecessors that we were able to learn from. As far back as 1975, there were teams from NASA and from Raytheon that demonstrated really fascinating instances of power beaming at very high efficiency, over 50% in the laboratory and at distances of over a mile and multiple kilowatts in excess of 30 kilowatts. So there has been work in this area. It's been a little intermittent and now we're seeing a resurgence of interest, not just at the Naval Research Laboratory, but around the United States and indeed around the world. There have been fantastic demonstrations in both Japan and China recently showing the promise of this technology and what is being achieved today. So there's a lot of exciting developments and I suspect in the coming years we'll see even more. For solar power satellites, you can think about it as comparable to GPS doing for navigation what are doing for energy what GPS has done for navigation. There's a couple different ways it could come together. Much as GPS was an effort done by the US government without a lot of input from industry and now it is something that everybody enjoys all around the world. You could see it coming together like that. You could also see it being something like the International Space Station where many different countries from around the world have worked together cooperatively to create this asset in space that has benefits for all of humanity. You could also look at another energy project like ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is in France. And this is an instance where there's cooperation between China, Russia, Japan, South Korea, India, the Euro European Union, United States, of course, and others to unlock the promise of fusion energy. And again, everyone is taking part in this effort. They're contributing resources and sharing the risk. A similar effort could be stood up for space solar in the same way where countries all around the world could participate. You could also look at what is right now the most profitable industry in space, which is communications, communication satellites. These were helped along by the forward thinking of folks in our government and in Congress in the 1960s, where they realized the potential of communications using satellites in space. And they set up the ComSat Act and corporations, nonprofit corporations, to help develop the technology, to work through the regulations in order to make this a reality. And similarly, maybe we could set up a Sunset Corporation or something that does the same for power satellites. I have to emphasize though that there's many challenges, many unknowns, and one of the things that we do in research is to try to investigate those and come out and figure where the greatest challenges are, where and if they can be overcome, how to approach them, and then decide the best way to move forward. If you want to learn more about any of the things that I've spoken about today, whether it's Lectena, Pram, or some of the laser power beaming demonstrations that we've done, the NRL YouTube channel is an excellent resource. We have many videos there, and there's a lot on NRL's website. In particular for Lectena, we have a whole page for educators and for students who want to do the Lectena power beaming demonstration themselves at home, just like it was done in space by astronaut Jessica Muir.